Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to our lecture series. We shall now pass the stage to our esteemed guest lecturer, Mr. Chia Chenghai, once again to initiate the second part of our discussion titled Stock Market Investing, Five Important Lessons. Well, I think the, most people are back, so I'll, I'll, I'll start straight away. Uh, so in this second part of our uh, afternoon together today, I will give a general outline of uh, what amounts to our investment philosophy. Uh, it's important to emphasize that these principles are derived from actual practice through, uh, I estimate, at least five market cycles in a particularly volatile part of the world. Uh, this has been essentially the uh, action plan of value partners. Uh, I used, before listing, I used to be very reluctant to share this kind of information. But I now realize that in fact it doesn't really matter because uh, the key is not actually the plan. The key is the execution. I, I think you know that quite well, Steve. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, the, the first point out of five points I want to make is that uh, I started off uh, when I was still a journalist with the uh, Wall Street Journal as a uh, f nighttime forex trader using the charting method. And I, I think I lost what, was, what little savings I had within about 60 days. Yeah. I was trading on the IMM in Chicago at night and working as a reporter in the daytime. There were a lot of compliance rules about trading as a financial journalist. So there are things we can do, things we couldn't do. And uh, I, I strongly believe in uh, things like resistance point and uh, charting and that kind of stuff. And uh, it took me a while to realize that, in fact, it's all bullshit. You know, it doesn't work. <laughs> but by then, I lost my money. You know? In uh, around about the year 1978, almost by chance, I came across a book called The Money Masters by a guy named John Train. I was actually going to... Uh, I actually met John Train in New York in the 1990s. But at that time, he's just a name. The Money Masters was a great intellectual discovery for me. I know it's not a big deal for most people, but for me, it is like, what, what have I been doing all these years? Why don't I know about this? The Money Masters, which is still available today, is nothing more than a collection of approximately 10 chapters on the grand masters of investing at that time. John Train interviewed each of them and brought up one chapter that amounts to the guy's life story and philosophy of investing. It's like writing about the Olympic champions of the world in each particular sport. And even today, I can recall uh, some of the uh, grandmasters of investing featured in the book. They included Sir John Templeton, Warren Buffett, George Soros, Peter Lynch of Fidelity, uh, and uh, Michael Steinhardt. And uh, when I read those chapters, for me, books are, uh, when I read a book, it's like someone is talking to me. I'm not really reading. I'm actually going through an oral exercise. And I was so impressed that uh, the majority of those uh, grandmasters didn't like charting, which I believe in. On the contrary, they were essentially value investors and contrarian investors. And uh, I then, uh, with my kind of uh, determination, set out to reinvent myself as a value investor. I taught myself accounting. I read many, many books, every book I could find on uh, how to do fundamental analysis. I devised uh, mental exercises for myself. Uh, example of a mental exercise, if I look at a situation, I then close my eyes and try to pretend, to imagine what the Wall Street Journal headline about that company will be like six months, 12 months, and three years from that point in time. And since I'm an experienced reporter, there are times when I actually got it right, to my own surprise. It's like trying to predict the future. All I had to do was look at an industry, a company, or a sector, and say, if six months from now I come back and look at it, what will be the newspaper headline about this particular situation in terms of the fundamentals? Uh, so by the, probably by 1983 or 84, uh, 
I, I spent two years in Singapore working for a paper that's now gone bankrupt called the Singapore Monitor. I was actually the foreign editor. Uh, anyway, I had actually knew, known that I was going to change career. It was just a matter of finding the right opportunity. Uh, and by then, I was firmly committed to the theory of value investing. The three hours of investing, finding the right people, run by the right business, run by the right people, and at the right price. Uh, it's not here, but we, I was using a formula called DuPont formula, which uh, basically is based on uh, return on equity and the quality or components of the return on the equity. That means the uh, profit margin multiplied by the uh, asset turnover ratio multiplied by the leverage. Uh, and I was trying to find companies that have something called a sustainable advantage over time, which is one of uh, Warren Buffett's uh, favorite principles about investing. Now, it's important to remember that value investing doesn't work all the time because human beings are irrational. There are many times when you see people will throw away value. Uh, according to people like uh, Bam Graham, the, my original master, that's when Mr. Market chooses to be irrational. You should treat the stock market as a human being and give him a name. The name of the stock market, according to Bam Graham, is Mr. Market. There are times when Mr. Market is very logical and deal with you in a fair way. There are times when he's too emotional and offer to sell you things at a ridiculously low price. That's when you should take advantage of Mr. Market. And there are times when Mr. Market is too exuberant and will not sell you things at even a fair price. That's the time you should stay away from Mr. Market. So I don't think of the stock market as the stock market. I think of it as I'm dealing with a human being called Mr. Market. In any event, uh, by the early 1980s, I had concluded that all the other styles I was dabbling in that had caused me so much pain, uh, like feng shui and top-down and technical analysis, were not going to work for me. And I was going to be a true classical value investor. Even though in Asia at the time, the theory was that the market, Asian markets are not open to uh, fundamental value investing because it's too emotional. Subsequently, I was approved that to be incorrect. Yeah. Now, here's the evidence. This is not me. This is just a Morgan Stanley uh, China index. And uh, it shows you different styles as defined by Morgan Stanley for investing in China. And it's very long term. It goes back to 1996. And there is no question about it. Value investing outperformed growth investing, the other major and popular style where people buy growth and are willing to pay a premium for growth businesses. The, uh, the growth value style actually underperformed even just the normal average MSCI China index. That's how over time it turned out to be inferior. For information, uh, the asset management industry as a whole is going through a time where many clients are questioning whether they should even employ human beings to run their funds. For example, in Value Partners, we now have a fast-growing division called the ETF division that offers exchange-traded fund products which rely on a computer to generate buy-sell signals. That's one of my innovations, by the way, because I came to realize that there are human beings out there now who don't even want to buy my expertise anymore, such as the, uh, the, the reduction in credibility of uh, human beings, active fund managers. You can see that on the uh, yellow line here where the world's best growth uh, investors were not even able to outperform the average index. But value does outperform. Now, point number two I want to say is that uh, I must truly am a believer in uh, being a long-term investor. I tend to buy and hold. Uh, over the short term, there will always be success stories about how some guy is so smart and flipped the stock or traded it within a day and make some money. But my experience with many of these people is that they only tell you their victories. They seldom tell you their losses because they are too humiliated to do so. I actually did a lot of research and came to the conclusion that true traders who can consistently make money over periods of time, 5, 10, 20 years, are actually very rare and probably not sustainable. And I think this point is especially true now because of the incredible volatility of markets. Now, you're not sure whether markets go up or down. One thing you can be sure about is that we are entering a period of extreme volatility. 
wild swings in prices, sometimes in the same day. In this situation, it's very easy to be whipsawed. Whipsawed is an English word that means you, you end up buying at the high and selling at the low instead of the other way around. You're supposed to buy low, sell high. But uh, this, this is because uh, in a volatile market, eventually you feel so bad, things keep going down that you sell. The moment you sell, in fact, that is the low. Then the good news come and you feel so good, you buy. With hindsight, that turned out to be the high. So you end up buying high and selling low. And I see this all over the world among both professional and amateur investors. I rather have, on the, on the basis of good research and fundamental analysis, buy and hold a good security for the long term and ride out the, the fluctuations. Point three is from experience rather than from any textbook. We found that uh, stocks that pay high dividends in cash uh, outperform, seriously outperform uh, normal stocks. So much so that we now have a fund called the uh, Value Partners uh, High Dividend Fund, which uh, has been able to generate exceptional returns. And uh, now it's quite a large fund, actually. It started very small. Uh, in fact, talking about the Hong Kong context, uh, of the total return we achieved, say 17%, uh, 20 to 30% didn't come from any real expertise. It simply came from collecting dividends which is the easy way out. Yeah. Uh, generally speaking, uh, you make your return, one, from collecting dividend, two, from increase or changes in earnings per share, if any, and three, from uh, change in market multiple. That means PE expansion or contraction. So in the Hong Kong context, uh, for a long time, we maybe make about 4% in dividend, 10% uh, in increase in earnings per share, and a little bit in PE multiple expansion. This is a breakdown of how we make our money. Point four is very difficult for many people to execute, especially people with a classical Asian education and culture, because they like to be part of the crowd. Asian people feel safe in crowds. I have never felt safe in crowds. I always want to go the other way. That's just my nature. And it turned out that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, being contrarian is practically the only way for an active fund manager like me to outperform. Because by definition, especially now in my own market of Hong Kong, I'm more or less the biggest in, in the market. I am the market, actually, for many sectors of the market. So the only way for me to outperform and deliver extra value is to think, keep doing new things that are not part of the conventional wisdom yet and make it work. Example, uh, in the late 1990s, uh, we were the world's pioneers in investing in a very obscure market called the China B share market, B for boy. B shares were a failed experiment. Uh, they traded at discounts of up to 70%, 70% to China A shares, even though they have the same voting and dividend rights. But B shares were priced in US and Hong Kong dollars, not in renminbi and they were considered to be not a respectable investment for institutional fund managers. So you go to a cocktail party, you shouldn't admit that you buy B shares because people think you're gambling you know, in the, this Mickey Mouse market. We set out the world's first B share fund and it doubled within 24 months and helped to make my reputation. Uh, so there was an example where we bought not just one stock, we bought an entire market and make it make a big difference. Point five, uh, the last point, is something I already mentioned earlier, but I just repeat it. It really has to do with strength of character. Rather than any uh, training or formal education, I think Professor Wu Wing Tai also mentioned more or less the same point. Uh, it's all about your character, your strength of character, your discipline, whether you're an ethical person and uh, you have a strong fighting spirit that can handle uh, defeats and go on to fight the next battle. This is something that even you go to the best universities or uh, your parents are very rich can, uh, this uh, cannot help you. You just got to develop the strength of character. And this is critical to a endurance test like long-term investing where the markets can go against you 
through no fault of your own for long periods of time. Since I still have a little bit more time, I also offer, I can share with you also what I learned about Asian stock markets. There are some interesting highlights. Uh, the efficient market theory that we uh, learn in business school simply doesn't work. Now, I wish it works. The efficient market theory says that share prices efficiently reflect the correct price for a given security, taking all factors into account. Uh, but I found that that's nonsense. Yeah. Share prices are priced very inefficiently almost all the time. And the smaller the company, the more inefficient is the pricing. That's why people like me are able to actually do quite well because we take advantage of market inefficiency. And as I mentioned, it's quite important in Asia to understand the social, political, and even historical significance of what's going on, not just the financials. For example, in my, uh, one of my specialist markets, which is China, uh, it's quite important to remember that uh, in the mind of the Chinese people, the country suffered about 150 years of humiliation, including uh, foreign aggression, bullying, being turned into a semi-colony. So there are many decisions made by the Chinese authorities today that are not actually very logical, financially speaking. But they do it because they want to restore the country's pride and self-esteem. So you have to understand that kind of history, where they're coming from. I'm sure the same story can be made for many other countries possibly including India or Malaysia, etc., where decisions are made because of a sense of historical injustice or other forms of uh, unfairness. Now, I think you should keep your portfolio diversified, not concentrated. This goes against what I preached in when I first started, when I only have a portfolio, maximum number is about 30 stocks because I want to only put my best ideas to work. But I found that this may be workable in a developed market, maybe, like the USA, but in Asia, no matter how high is your conviction level, some bad guy will always surprise you. Might be the crook, just when you're about to put 10% of your entire fund into this company, you know, and he disappear in the night. So now, I believe in having a very diversified portfolio, so I can sleep very soundly. No one can kill me anymore. I always say that I'm like a hotel with 300 rooms. So if a few guests skip down and don't pay the bill now and then, I'm okay. But in the old days, I was like a hotel with only 30 rooms. A guest not settling the room bill on departure was quite serious for me. The only problem in my statement is that you have to have a lot of research resources to buy 300 stocks, each one of which has to be carefully researched. The next thing you should know about our markets is that we are surrounded by people I call pirates, not Somali pirates. These are actually professional people whose main, uh, main objective in life is to talk to fund managers like me, tell us what we want to hear, and then get money from us because they know we control a lot of money. And this money doesn't, is not our personal money. We're just guardians of other people's money. So we are surrounded by people wearing suit and tie who is constantly getting appointments with my colleagues and I, trying to persuade us to invest in their favorite projects. It could be mining, education, manufacturing, consumer retailing. And actually, once you put in the money, the story can change very fast, and your money can also disappear very quickly. I gave you earlier the example of the no frills airline, when I lost 30 million US in six months. So, and these people, some of them are ex-fund managers themselves. So they know what we want to hear. They can construct a presentation using PowerPoint to a point where, if I want to do my job properly, I must agree to invest in their project. Otherwise, I'm not doing my job properly. But in fact, the whole thing is just a show. You know, it, the projects usually are lousy. Yeah. So from bitter experience of losses, I have learned to be quite careful when I meet people who talk too well, dress too smart, and uh, went to all the right universities. You know? because many of them are professional pirates, if I believe. Yeah. But on the hand, if I meet a guy who is quite simple and uh, maybe wear jeans, you know, and seem to be like, get his hands dirty tight, I actually listen very carefully. Because I, I feel that this, if you dare to walk to my room and talk to me about your favorite investment and the possible high potential rewards of being a shareholder of your enterprise, there is less chance you're a pirate. Yeah. 
unless you are the biggest of them all, the most convincing actor. <laughs> okay, the other two points I covered earlier, but anyway, just to repeat, uh, our industry, uh, our main enemy is ourselves, in the sense that we are finding, we are no shortage of demand for our products. Actually, with the liberalization and reforms going on in the People's Republic of China, demand for asset management services is actually exploding. You know, I, c I could double my size, frankly speaking, in the next 24 to 36 months, if I had the right capacity. And what is holding me back is two things. Not enough people with soft skills. I'm amazed by how many people coming to my office for jobs who are totally qualified on a technical point of view, on paper, but cannot even meet a client with any kind of com confidence. You know, they don't know what to do with human beings, they don't know what to do with one another, and they have no soft skills in terms of leadership. Very common. And surprisingly, the other shortage we have, which I didn't cover earlier, is that we are short of back office and middle office people. We are actually trying to propose to the government of Hong Kong to set up a polytechnic to train back office technicians. That's where Penang may have a role. Over the years, all the young guys with big ambitions, they all want to be fund managers, they want to be investment bankers, they want the glamorous frontline jobs. In the meantime, the back office jobs like portfolio administration, uh, compliance and legal, uh, portfolio, uh, yeah, portfolio and uh, other operational skills that are necessary, they have been neglected. So we are now actually paying more for good compliance people than for frontline office managers because of the shortage. We means uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, London, New York, the major financial centers, great shortage. Okay, and I also mentioned earlier about the money disease. I, I'm actually quite careful when I notice that the potential employee or staff member is very obviously focused on how much money he or she can make rather than how to provide the best possible service for the client. I think that's getting the, the cart before the horse and uh, I will act accordingly. Yeah. Okay. In terms of global investment outlook, uh, which is uh, the last part of the talk, uh, I think there's another financial crisis coming. It's going to be a big one. It's probably bigger than 2008. I think the whole global uh, situation is very unsettled. It has to do, this is not a real financial crisis, it's actually a, a political and social crisis that manifests itself as a financial crisis. It has to do partly with the political structure of the Western countries where uh, politicians have to make very unrealistic promises so that they can get voted in every five years or four years. The result of this system accumulating over many decades is that most of these countries are actually broke and can only come out of it through a lot of printing of money, assuming the markets continue to accept the paper. So I'm under no illusions. I think the coming uh, years is going to be very difficult. I think, uh, I think Li Lim, for example, asked about uh, how, which fund they uh, buy, etc. My main idea at the moment is to have a very diversified portfolio, actually, with at least maybe 5 to 10% in gold. I'm that pessimistic. And I think you should also consider even things like keeping a weak supply of uh, food and water and other essentials in your house to prepare for any possible breakdown in social order. Yeah, I see a lot of uh, possibility for increase in social unrest around the world, partly to do with what I call the entitlement culture. Everyone now feels entitled to everything, regardless of whether they can afford it or whether they earn it or not. And this is true for both East and West. And uh, some countries are going through serious uh, depopulation because of the declining birth rates. There are not enough people anymore. And uh, the political system is broke and can't be fixed anymore by anybody. It's gone out of control. Unemployment is uh, actually very serious in many of the countries I have looked at or visited, partly because the system is broke and partly because of the growing use of robotics to replace uh, human beings. So uh, if you ask me for my personal outlook, more, my company's uh, neutral in the outlook because we are asset management. We don't want people, our clients to get too gloomy, right? But my personal outlook is different. I think we should prepare for the possibility of a serious financial crisis 
coming, uh, maybe five years, maybe ten years from now. I'm not sure. I think we diversify, and uh, I believe the next generation will never have the will, will be unlikely to enjoy the kind of opportunities and good luck that I enjoy. So they had to work that much harder. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chia, for the very informative lecture once again. Ladies and gentlemen, we have arrived at the Q&A session and the floor is now open for questions. <laughs>